Now, I'm thrilled to kind of turn to the main part of our show, now that I've got that out of the way. Um, so I'm gonna ask our um, two panelists to, to come up to the stage and then I will introduce them. Um, David, Dr. Michelson, why don't you come on up? I have very short bios, except for David's client list, which is four pages long, which I may choose to truncate. Um, so David will be our moderator. I'll give you this microphone because I've warmed it up. And um, So David Bailey is a founding partner of KPBB, uh, a true champion of entrepreneurs. David's practice specialized in, is in de developing and enforcing IP portfolios on behalf of cutting edge technology companies and leading research universities, including Caltech, NASA JPL, Stanford UCLA. David and I were talking over lunch about uh, a project at, at Caltech where they're capturing solar energy and beaming it down to the earth. Drew and I were talking about this earlier. And I said, isn't that a silly idea? And David said, oh yeah, we wrote the patents for that. So <laughs> I'm still, sorry, David, I'm sure it's a great idea. Um, anyway, David has extensive experience guiding numerous clients through um, diligence and um, the process associated with fundraising and IPOs. He's worked with, I'm not, there are like 30 venture firms here that he's the guy. So thank you, David, for all your work. Um, and uh, today, um, he's gonna be um, interviewing Dr. Gary Michelson. Dr. Gary Michelson, um, MD, is a board certified orthopedic spinal surgeon, an inventor and founder and co-chair of Michelson Philanthropies. Dr. Michelson is one of the most prolific inventors in the history of medicine and the sole named inventor on more than 990 issued patents worldwide, and is one of the very few people ever inducted to both the National Inventors Hall of Fame, as well as the National Academy of Inventors. Wow, amazing, a thousand? It's impressive. <laughs> Not a thousand. I was at um, Caltech talking with a very prolific inventor there named Maury Grahib, and he, and he told me he had 160 patents. So I gotta tell him he's better to get his button gear because he's your way ahead. Um, in 2016, um, Dr. Michelson signed the Giving Pledge aren't familiar with that. It's a campaign founded by Bill Gates and Warren Buffett that encourages the wealthiest individuals to co contribute the majority of their fortune to philanthropic causes. I can tell you, um, following Gary and his um, philanthropic activities, he lives by that pledge, and um, we're grateful to have him here in Southern California and the support that his organization is providing. So anyway, I'm super thrilled to have both of you here, and I'm going to turn it over to David um, to have a conversation with Dr. Michelson. Thanks very much. Do you want to just get your microphone set up there? Well, uh, Dr. Michelson, thank you so much, first of all, for signing the Giving Pledge and for all your philanthropic activities, but also for, um, more importantly, uh, donating your valuable time to, uh, to talk to all of us today. We have a, a large number of uh, entrepreneurs in the audience who no doubt will hope to <laughs> replicate some tiny fraction of the success that you've had in your own career. Um, so before we, we talk, dive into a, a discussion of intellectual property and, and your views on the licensing of intellectual property, um, why don't we just go back to the beginning? You didn't set out to be an inventor or an entrepreneur, if I understand it correctly. You, you first headed to medical school. Well, this all started actually when I was a little boy. Um, I don't know if anybody here is Jewish, but there's always this debate about when a fetus becomes a human being. But if you're Jewish, it's when you graduate from medical school. <laughs> and, and my grandmother uh, actually had a very nasty disease called syringomyelia. Uh, and what it does is it destroys the uh, tracks that come out of the brain that transmit pain and temperature. So I was, I think, in first grade, and I was sitting there, and she was making something on the stove. And I really smelled something terrible. And I looked over, and her arm was on fire. And she's just casually talking to me. And I mean, I get nightmares for years. But she said to me, you know, it's okay, because you're going to become a doctor and you're going to fix my back. I was the only kid that went through grammar school, junior high school, high school, college, and kept saying, I'm going to be a spine surgeon. When I finally graduated medical school and did a residency, everybody looked at me and they said, what are you talking about? Nobody wants to be a spine surgeon. And the truth was, back in those days, if you did the operations, you did them correctly, about half the times the patients got better, and the other half they didn't, and some got worse. So I understood their concern. But the reality was, that became a great opportunity to make things better, because they really were so bad. 
And, and that all started with a uh, bone spur that I believe you des described as a rhinoceros horn. So talk us, talk us through, you know, what was your inventive moment? What, what kind of put you on this pathway to being an entrepreneur? So anyway, when um, I finished my residency, there were just a handful of fellowships in spine surgery in the entire country because nobody wanted to do them. And essentially what you'd be doing was apprenticing to learn how to make a violin with a master violin maker. So I did a fellowship and during that fellowship, we were operating on a woman and took out a herniated disc, which was pressing on the nerve root. And then after I did that, there was a big spur of bone that was pressing right into the nerve root. So I said to the gentleman who ran the program, whose name was Alex Brotsky, I said, Alex, what are we gonna do for that? Cause I'm there to learn, he's supposed to be teaching me. And he goes, we're gonna do nothing. And I'll tell you why. He said, many years ago, I tried to bite one of those off. And it was so hard that the end of the instrument exploded in the patient's spine. And we spent the next two hours pulling pieces of metal out of the dural sac. And he said, on the other hand, my friend, who happened to be another world famous surgeon, tried to take it out of the burr and wound up a young woman's spinal cord and paralyzed her up to her neck. He said, so we're gonna do nothing. So I left my fellowship and I wasn't really satisfied with that particular answer. And sure enough, I'm in private practice and I see the exact same thing. So I decided that I would do something, but I would do something safe. And um, it's one thing to be an inventor. It's another thing to be an inventor in the circumstance of being a physician because you're always confined by do no harm. So what I did do was I protected the dural sac that has the end of the spinal cord and the nerves with what's called a dural sac protector. And I protected the root with a root protector. And then I was just looking at this spur and I decided I would get an impactor and basically drive the spur down and then take it out. So there's an old saying in orthopedics, which probably makes us different than neurosurgeons, that if, it first, if at first you don't succeed, just go get a bigger hammer. And so I'm, I'm going, pew, 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 nothing's happening and finally what? And they went, Pop. So, so talk to me about what, what went through well, your head when yeah. it went pop. Yeah. Well, there was definitely a moment of silence. Is that you and me? Yeah, yeah I'm trying to turn myself off. Okay. So, right. Anyway, I'm looking in there and there isn't a drop of blood. So that was strange because normally you break a bone, there's bleeding, nothing. And I say this to people sometimes that inventing is an iterative process. And it goes to the nature of failure and perseverance. <laughs> when one attempts something and you don't succeed at first, it truly is only a failure if you stop right then and there. But if you continue on the success, then each one of those times you did not succeed is simply a step in it or a process. The reason there was no bleeding is because the piece of bone that broke got driven down into the soft bone that was underneath and what would have bled became like a cork. It just sealed it. And so that particular thing was a success. And what happened was I went home and started thinking about how would I reach these other spurs that were various locations in the canal. And I designed a set of instruments for no other purpose. I had what was called a referral practice. So the only patients that were being sent to me by other doctors were the patients they had already operated on who did not get better. So they would send the patient to you like you go deal with that. And then they'd want to be there in the operating room assisting. And when I would bring out these instruments, they go, whoa, where'd you get those? I said, well, I had those made. They said, well, make me a set. So every couple of weeks, we were making another set of instruments. And, and I don't know how many people, you know, most of you people aren't old enough to know this, but there was a time when you went to get business cards and a thousand was some price and 5,000 wasn't much more because the whole price had to do with setting up the type to make the cards. Nowadays, we use computers, so it's not like that. But the machinist said to me, what are you doing? Every time you order a set of instruments, I have to go to the machines, change the heads on the machines. That's where all the work is. 
just make 100 sets. And I looked at him and said, what would I do with 100 sets? And he said, sell them. And, and that became the, 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 the first step of, of, amongst the whole host of inventions that you made in, in that field. Now, we could probably spend the rest of the afternoon talking about your experiences uh, during that time. I, I've had the opportunity to discuss uh, many of the travails that Dr. Michelson had um, during that process. But a, a really successful aspect of your growing your business was licensing patents. So can, and that in, and I take it you didn't just apply for patents and then the largest medical device companies in the country came forward and said they wanted to take a license. Do you want to share some of your experiences in, in trying to get other companies to, to work with you to license the ability to manufacture the tools you were inventing? Well, that was a lot. Let me yeah. see where I can start on that. Um, so my approach was... First of all, I know that some people here heard today about provisional patent applications. Is that correct? Okay. 35 USC 111 provides for what's called a provisional patent application. You do not need an attorney. You don't need anything. You can get the form online for nothing. You fill out the form and you describe your invention in as much detail as you possibly can. If you have drawings, great. If not, you can actually send in photographs. They won't become part of a patent when it issues, but you can send that in. You can send whenever you want. <laughs> that puts your marker down in time. And it gives you at least one year to file a formal utility patent. During that year, you may legally say, I have a patent pending. And more importantly, you don't need a non-disclosure agreement to engage large companies. I can remember having sent something to 3M that was right down their alley. They put it in an envelope and sent it back to me. And they didn't even open it. And they said, we do not take unsolicited submissions. Many years later, I was friends with the guy who was chief patent counsel for 3M because I was on the Intellectual Property Owners Education Foundation. He was also. And I asked him about that. And he said, listen, we had so many problems with people claiming that a product we made, we stole from them when we already had it. He said, it just wasn't worth it to us. So we don't take unsolicited offers of intellectual property. But if you don't need an NDA and you actually have protection even through a provisional patent application, my advice would be call the president of the company. Now that may sound a bit bold, but I'll tell you what will happen. I remember uh, with my very first um, implant invention, I called up the guy who was the head of the largest orthopedic company in the United States, Zimmer. Because I'm a doctor, I guess they put the call through to him. I'm having a conversation with him. He was very nice. He said, look, you're talking to the wrong guy. I've got somebody who runs our spine division because they had hips and knees and everything. And he said, and I've got a guy who's new business. Why don't I put you in touch with those two guys? I said, I have a better idea. Why don't I get on a plane so that you're not inconvenienced? I want exactly 10 minutes of your time. If after 10 minutes you're bored, just tell me to leave. Nobody can turn down an offer like that. So I went out there, and it wasn't him. It was him and 30 people in the room. And I said to him, how many spine surgeries have you done? And he laughed. I said, well, you're going to do one today, and you're going to be done in 10 minutes. And it's the equivalent of what we do today it takes five hours. And he just looked at me in disbelief. Sure enough, I had a model of the spine. We took out the instruments. I never touched them. I said, put the first instrument here, do this, that. And in 10 minutes, he had done a decompression, uh, inner body fusion, and a stabilization all simultaneously. That is five hours of surgery by the method that it replaced. And he said, we're doing it. And it wasn't anybody in the room who was going to say, no, we're not. So if you want some advice, don't work your way up the chain. That's just one chance after another of somebody playing whisper down the lane to get it wrong and for your presentation to fail. That would be some good advice. Yeah, that sounds like fantastic advice. Um, so just, just kind of on that part, I assume you had patents on the technology that you were presenting to them that day. You don't have to have a patent. Mm -hmm. You have to have an application or a provisional patent application, which is even better. Because question, let me, let me just say this real quickly. Provisional patent applications are the absolute democratization of the intellectual property system in the United States. 
the fee, the papers are free. You go to the USPTO, download them. The fee for a large company, $300. The fee for a company having up to 500 employees, $150. And the fee for the rest of us, $75. And for $75, you can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the biggest company in the United States with all their lawyers. how you and so what, how did you first uh, you know where, where did you get your information so David's point which I will hone in on is I have heard presidents of universities give speeches about the mission of the university and it always goes something like this we don't know what the future holds, but our mission is to educate our students to become lifelong learners and to prepare them for the future. To which I say, bullshit, come on. When I was a kid, 85% of the value of the America's largest companies resided in their buildings and their machinery. And today, 85% of the Standard & Poor's value is in their intellectual property. If that were a true statement, then these colleges and universities will be teaching four credit courses on intellectual property, and they're not. So we basically, our, our foundation created the first freely downloadable textbook for people other than attorneys on intellectual property. It's very readable. We have modules if you want to understand licensing. And in addition to that, that wasn't enough. We had to actually create a course in a box for a university or college to be able to teach a four credit intellectual property course. And if you look at where um, the, the wealthiest companies in the world are today, the so-called Fangs, the Facebook and the Apples and the Netflix and Mike, all these companies were started by people who were in the college demographic. So why, why would the colleges not be teaching this? This is what they should be teaching. Yeah, absolutely. And I have to say, you've got to be commended for seeing a problem and actually doing something about it. I think a lot of us tend to complain about these things these days, but setting up the, uh, the Michelson IP initiative is, is fantastic. I was doing some back of the envelope calculations. Uh, I think probably more people have taken the online course since it's been posted than lawyers, uh, uh, law students have taken IP courses at law schools. And so, federal judges. Yep, yeah, indeed. So it's, a, it's an absolute testimony to just like the demand there is. It's obviously a niche topic. But I'd certainly encourage everyone in the audience, if, if you're building a business around an idea, you need to educate yourself about the intellectual property system because that's, that's how you capture value. David, can I tell you this group, great story? You sure. Please, about please. If, if you're building a business. So I had a nephew, he was 25 at the time. He graduated from the London School of Economics. It's not a bad school. And he came to me because I had some money and he said, I want you to loan me the money. I want to start this company. And at the time, there was no Zoom. And basically, it was a great idea. It was Facebook with video. I mean, that, that was really the long and short of it. And he had this name, CNBC. Okay, so he gets all done doing a presentation. He says, what do you think? I said, that is a great idea. How are you going to protect it? And he looks at me and he goes, what are you talking about? I go, well, it's a great idea. So if it starts to succeed, what stops one of the big social media platforms from simply taking it? They can offer it for nothing because they make their money in other ways. You need a subscription. And how are you going to protect it? And he, he kind of stomped out and he goes, well, you just don't understand how the Internet works, which was true. So I couldn't argue. But two years later, two years later, he put his life into this thing. He had raised over two and a half million dollars. Um, two things happened simultaneously. Several platforms started to offer for free exactly what he was trying to sell and he got a cease and desist letter over the name from somebody who actually owned the trademark. So um, what David has said is correct. If you want to start a business, give yourself an edge. And, and this goes to um, issues of social equity. I don't go too far afield, but probably your ability to start a business, this is sad, but it has a lot to do with the zip code that you were born into. So, um, most new businesses get started by asking mom and dad for a loan. 
But if you weren't born in that zip code, they can't give you the money. So you better have something else to take to people who aren't your mom and dad to say, I'll make an investment. And what you want is IP. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll just to kind of double down on that point. I think one of the top five reasons that startups fail is they infringe on someone's trademark. So make sure when you're choosing your branding that you, you, you get some advice or, or do a search. Yeah, you know? Uber's the best example. I think they own six cars because they're, they're doing some pilot work on self-driving cars. They don't own anything. You know what? They have trademarks and, and it's billions of dollars of value in trademarks. Yeah. And, and if I could just pull on the, the thread of, of access to entrepreneurialism, that's something that you're also tackling with the Michelson IP initiative as well. If you want to just touch on how you're trying to, you're not just targeting students in elite colleges, but you're yeah. trying to get this coursework out as, as widely as possible. If that's something that you'd like to share with us, I'm sure people would be interested. David's point's well made. So it turns out, and this was the first time I heard this, was from the gentleman who had recently got hired, but that was in 2005, to take over the SATs. They hired this young guy who drinks way too much coffee. And, and he, well, Wait, that's possible? I didn't realize you could, you could drink too much. You need a lot of coffee just to listen fast enough to hear what he was saying. Dynamic guy, and he wrote uh, a public letter stating that the SATs should not be used to decide who and who gets into college, who doesn't, that they were racially biased. He went on and on. He just tore them apart. And he said in that in this letter, and he said in my his conversation to me, the single best prognosticator of your success in life and your academic success is the zip code that you were born into. And it's been proven over and over and over again. And if it sounds too hard to believe, think about it. In some zip codes, both of the parents went to college. They exchange thousands of words a day, and the words are from a rich vocabulary. The kids have every possible support and access to the very best education possible. It's really not surprising. And so who's the other end of that spectrum? Well, go take a look at, at the historically black universities and colleges. Now, they do turn out most of the scientists of color, but the rate at which they do that is appallingly low. The number of patents that they get are appalling low. In fact, let's take another step. In this country, women's names only appear on about 18% of patents, and they have 50% of the brains, and some would argue the best brains. And by the way, most of those are not where they're the sole named inventor, but where they're an incidental name, where a whole group that say Facebook is working on something, or Apple's working on something. So there's 20 names, and one of them happens to be a woman. So what are we doing? We're cheating, we're cheating our GDP, our country, out of the best brains. So we need to do something to make sure we recruit women and people of color and try to have some equity in here for our own sakes. Indeed. Um, now, I want to reserve some time. Uh, both you and Andy had suggested that we uh, have some Q&A. So start thinking about some questions, and I'll, I'll walk around with the microphone for people who, who want to uh, ask Dr. Michelson a question. But before we do, a theme that's come up in, in our conversations and, and a theme that has come up in, in many conversations that I've had with other entrepreneurs is just how difficult it is to be an entrepreneur and the adversities that, um, that you'll face as an entrepreneur. And so I wonder whether you can kind of share your thoughts on on your experience as an entrepreneur and just how much perseverance has played a role in your success. So it's interesting. I believe that it turns out that the qualities you need to be a successful serial inventor and to be a good scientist are identical. You need some measure of intellect. And I say some measure, and I'll tell you why in a moment. You need some measure of knowledge. You need imagination. You need permission. What permission? The permission that your mother did not give you to color outside of the lines and to think outside the box. You have to give that to yourself. And an interesting point about that is Jim Allison, the gentleman who just won the Nobel Prize for his work on um, checkpoint inhibitors, cancer immunotherapy. The experiment that he ran that eventually led to his Nobel Prize 
was the undoing of all of the research that NIH had funded because they only fund incremental research. So when somebody purportedly proves something, they're willing to fund things that just go a step further. They're never willing to fund something that would upset the order or be high risk, high return. So after all this money had been invested, all this research had been done, Jim said, you know what? I don't think this is right. And he ran, and they wouldn't fund it, by the way. Mike Milken wrote the check by which he did the research. And he ran the experiment to undo the original research and turned out to be wrong and he turned out to be right. Think about what level of daring and permission that takes. So you need intellect, you need knowledge, you need daring, you need permission. And the thing you need most of all is perseverance. Because you're not going to win the first time. You're not going to succeed the first time. And if you're going to put your tail between your legs and go home, don't bother. So you need to persevere. And that's more important than everything else. Yeah, I, I have to say, when we founded our firm, uh, an entrepreneur who I admire a lot, a lot I, I asked him for some advice. And he his said, the only thing I have to tell you is that there will be heartache, which wasn't exactly the, uh, <laughs> the, the encouragement I was looking for when I just quit my job. But um, you know, he's right. It's, it really is a, a, a challenging but very rewarding path. How many people here have heard the old soul? that if you build a better mousetrap, they'll beat a path to your door. Anybody here ever hear that? It's an old saying. It's crap. Um, <laughs> listen, it's absolute crap. The world was getting along just fine before your invention. And there is an established status quo. You are going to upset some people. You're going to not make friends. And so they're not going to beat a path to your door. They're going to try to beat you. So I just want to tell you, you have to be prepared for that. Um, and eventually, if you have perseverance, you will succeed. That's all I can tell you, really. And, and so before I throw it open to questions, I know we've got a lot of investors in the audience and uh, you're obviously still profoundly engaged with medical research as a result of your philanthropic activities. Um, I'm sure they'd love to hear, what are the things that excite you at the moment that you're seeing through, through as a result of the work that you're continuing to do? Yeah, the greatest advance in science today is big data. Big data has the, the, the power to change every aspect of research, including medical research. And um, I, I make the analogy that it's like sucking on a fire hose. There's so much stuff coming out that a human brain cannot make sense or order of that. So then you need the computational scientists, you need the deep machine learning, the AI and the pattern recognition to derive meaning from that. So that's the greatest tool available right now. And the two things that are gonna radically change medicine are gene editing, because there's over 8,600 autosomal dominant hereditary diseases. And this one thing is the answer to every single one of them. So that is gonna change things dramatically. And the other one is immunology. So let me talk to you about immunology just a little bit. Every time you get a vaccine or your children get a vaccine, that's immunology. In fact, that's immunotherapy. That's the application of immunology to either treat or prevent a disease. So we've been doing immunotherapy for a long, long time. Now, lately, the advances of, of immunology in the field of cancer have been so dramatic and so wonderful that the word immunotherapy has almost become synonymous with cancer therapy. And I'm sure everybody here is acquainted with the story of Jimmy Carter, who had a um, very short fuse death sentence diagnosis of advanced metastatic malignant melanoma. That's the kind of diagnosis where when the doctor tells you that, he says, Jimmy, you're my friend, don't bother stopping at the dry cleaners on your way home. Go home, kiss the wife, and fill out your papers because you're gone. Now, Jimmy Carter was cured, not from chemotherapy, but from immunotherapy, which enabled his own immune system to now see these cancer cells, which were hiding and destroy every one of them, wherever they were. So that's the power of, of immunotherapy. All right, well, investors, you've, you've got some received wisdom there. Um, okay, so I'm going to pop up now. Uh, if anyone has questions, and particularly if they are presenting today, make sure you give your company a plug. I'm going to start over here. Um,
So thanks. If you could just stand up and introduce okay. yourself. Yep. Great. Hello, Dr. Mickelson. Um, thanks so much for being with us today. I admire your work a lot. Uh, my name is Patricia Eisenhart. And um, I, I was inspired to hear you talk about improving diversity in our field. And I hear you about the need for perseverance. I was wondering if you have any advice in particular for a woman in this field, entrepreneurial life science, um, who asks the question, what if? As you know, when we ask what if, there are a lot of people that will shut you down right away. And um, I think women will maybe respond to that and back off from that a little more quickly than a man will. It's just my personal, I know that about myself, I'll just say that. Do you have any thoughts about that advice for women asking what if? You know, uh, I don't know if you've ever read um, the story of Madame Curie. Have you ever read the story of Madame Curie? She was the first woman ever admitted into the Paris University. She won three Nobel Prizes in two different areas. Um, brilliant woman at a time when women were not allowed to do anything. So I would start off by reading her story because it's just absolutely inspirational. Um, I do think things are changing. Um, we ourselves try to promote STEM very early on and very diversely. And if you're excluded from STEM, it's pretty hard as a woman to go on into science, as you are probably aware. Um, not very long ago, and I'm sure you're aware of this, there was a very big scandal down at Scripps. Scripps is a research center, and there were allegations from several of the women researchers that they were basically being ignored and squeezed out, and the accusations were true. So, and that's just a few years ago. So what you're describing is very real, and it's very difficult, and Unfortunately, and this is just the reality, that NIH is an old white boys club. The logistics of how it operates, how it funds, everything is there to maintain their hold on those dollars. And, and actually, Francis Collins, to his credit, tried to fix that, and they shut him down. So it, it's a tough problem that you're talking about, and again, I wish I had an answer for you. I'm not a woman. I didn't have to experience that. But I can tell you this. I did everything I did on my own. I never asked somebody for a research dollar. I didn't want to be beholden to somebody. Now, fortunate enough, I guess as a physician, I had enough dollars I could do it myself. But I did most of my work at the kitchen table or out in my garage. I'm not saying that you can't. But I think to the extent you can rely on yourself, and if my wife were here, she would be advocating for a sisterhood there's other people in your situation, and you should have a group of people to support you. But, and this is the toughest thing because it's easy for me to say, you really have to believe in yourself. And you have to, again, persevere. So I'm sorry, that's really the best answer I can give you. Hi, Dr. Mickelson. Um, it's, first of all, a pleasure to speak with you today. I um, just really, very admire, um, admire your work. Um, my name is Julio Latore, and um, I'm co-founder of Aerosolve. Um, I am presenting at the Life Sciences section, I think at 2.30, we're the first presentation, just putting the plug out there. Um, so just um, I'm, I'm asking from a perspective of a physician um, entrepreneur, um, I'm sure, you know, as a physician entrepreneur, it's pretty lonely space, um, but I would imagine it was even lonelier when you got started. Uh, right now we have, you know, whole university ecosystems and accelerators and, um, things that are just like designed to put us in front of the right type of people, which I'm sure it makes the, the, the process more efficient, um, but there's still failures, obviously. Um, you didn't have that. Um, you know, what, what was the thing that was driving you? Like, what was giving you the perseverance when you were starting out? You know, we, you didn't have these accelerators and I'm sure there wasn't many people to look up to or admire, um, particularly when you have a lucrative career. Um, that's, you know, I would imagine it wasn't, presumably it wasn't, um, you know, life or death situation. So it's something that was driving you. I'm just curious to more expand on that. Well, first of all, I really believe that most of the people, if not almost all of the people that become physicians really do want to help people. Because if you're smart enough to be a physician, you could probably go and be an investment banker or something else that you didn't care about people and you just wanted to make money. So the thing about being a surgeon is it shares the same property as being a cabinet maker. 
you only get to make one cabinet at a time. The difference is being an inventor is a mass multiplier effect. If I invent a new operation and the instruments by which to do that operation, then there'd be 10,000 or 20,000 surgeons doing that and millions of people be helped. So that's sort of an irresistible draw. And, and Dr. Michelson, if I can just prompt you, I remember you saying that your, your brother predicted you're going to basically wind up where you are. Isn't that correct? You want to just share that story? You're, well, you're not your average doctor, is that correct? Well, it was his watch I was taking apart. <laughs> yeah. So, so the, there's a story of uh, your brother wrote a letter in support of your application to medical school saying that, that he had expectations that you're going to do great things in medicine. So, well, David's, um, David's bringing up an interesting point. I actually had a brother who was off the charts, conspicuously brilliant, which is not good when you're kids. We would play cards, and he'd say, turn over the cards, and you did. And he could write, recite back to you 14 different cards, the denomination and the color, 14. So I don't know what kind of intellect that is, but you don't want that for your brother. <laughs> a anyway, uh, but when we were kids, he got a, a, a watch for his birthday. It's, by the end of the afternoon, I'd taken it apart. So he wasn't pleased. And many, many years later, um, we were at the dinner and he said, you know what I really hated about you as a kid? Which is an interesting line. And I thought there'd probably be a lot of things. He said, when you took apart that watch, I said, come on, it was like a cheap watch. What's the difference? He goes, no, 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 that's not the point. He said, I was perfect at every single thing I did. I was first in my class in high school. I was first in my class in college. He graduated from medical school with a PhD, MD at the same time. He said, I wanted to take apart that watch, but I couldn't do it because I couldn't be guaranteed that I could put it back together and you didn't care. So that goes to that story I told you about giving yourself permission. Interesting story. And Dave, th thanks again for sharing. So. Thank you for your time today. Uh, I'm James Bottom. I used to run the largest startup program at USC, and now I help university ecosystems build angel investing syndicates. My question is, what should we be doing different in tech transfer offices, and how should the VC community be participating and helping? It's interesting that you asked that question <clears throat> because the Brookings Institute did a study about, I don't <clears throat> know where my voice went, but the Brookings Institute did a study, I think it was about 10 years ago, and they concluded that about 87% of the tech transfer departments in the American universities and colleges were actually losing money every year. So typically in the past, not, not so much lately, but typically in the past, they would license out some invaluable technology, get a 5% royalty and be celebrating. And the problem was that if it's a medical discovery, and unless you license it to Big Pharma, there's no, nothing you can do with it. And because Pharma had that leverage, they would give out these 5% royalties and take the technology. <clears throat> and part of the solution today is that you can create what's called a GMP, which is a good manufacturing practice facility that's pre-approved by the FDA. And then if you're a university, you can actually manufacture your own drugs, run your own human trials, and actually see the full value of the medical discoveries you've made. So I think that's going to be a dramatic change if more universities do that. Hi, Dr. Michelson. I'm Guy Rockin. I'm a founder of a company called SciFind. That's a social collaboration network for scientists. Um, I was curious if you have, are there any caveats to having um, a patent system that um, basically, is there any repercussion of it that influences the way that science is conducted? For example, like in, the, in what happened with CRISPR, right? We had this technology developed that it was caught up in these court cases for years and years instead of being utilized, uh, despite the fact that it was publicly funded or biotech companies trying to license genes where it's just a, you know, it's a matter of fact. It's not, a, it's not an invention, it's a thing. Great question. So uh, a, a very famous decision was um, by a judge called Judge Sweet, where he reemphasized that um, 
things God has designed, built, created are non-patentable material. So you can't actually patent a gene. Um, that became very important in the BRC genes. You can patent a test perhaps, but you cannot patent the gene. That's impatentable material. <laughs> you said something else I wanted to respond to. Um, what was the other point you raised? Oh, about, about CRISPR. So in the United States, the patent system permits anybody to do research on anything, whether it's protected by a patent or not. You may not be able to commercialize, but you absolutely can do research. So the war that went on between the Broad Institute and Jennifer Dudna at Berkeley in no way impacted the ability of other people to do research or in fact, to use the technology. And yes, there was a lot of money at stake, but in the end, they both formed companies, they both liked the technology and everybody got rich. So the patent system worked its way out. So that really wasn't a hindrance to science in any way. I love that you quoted a judge in that response. I'm not sure I would have been able to do that. <laughs> this is supposedly my field. Um, and I, I just want to put a, put a little uh, bug in people's ears about judicial efficiency. I mean, one of the biggest problems that faces most IP owners is the fact that it takes forever to get your case heard. Um, so. For, for people who are in this room, and particularly people who are uh, members of professional organizations representing universities, probably the single best thing you can do to increase the value of your intellectual property is get Congress to fund the judiciary. Um, you know, it's pretty typical for a case in Delaware to take 10 years to get heard, which if you're an entrepreneur, that's the death of your company right there. So, you know, it's not so much the laws on the books currently, it's the, the speed with which they're being administered. Um, so yeah, another question here. Hi, Dr. Michelson. I'm Dana Brofman, an entrepreneur. Can you talk about, you mentioned big data. Can you talk about how far along you think um, AI and machine learning is in terms of being useful for um, doing clinical trials faster um, to get to an answer about whether the science has enough efficacy and is viable enough? sooner instead of 10 or 12 years or 15 years maybe we can do it a few years earlier so that we can save more people does everybody in the room know who dale carnegie is wrote the book yeah okay making friends influence people he gave some good advice he said if you're speaking in public it's best to only speak about things you know something about i know nothing about that <laughs> I, I just wouldn't have the answer so i'm the wrong guy that's why I apologize. Well, um, on that very humble note, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure there's many people in your position who would actually uh, profess to, to not know something about a topic and then not give us all their opinion on how it should, uh, it should be played out. So uh, uh, yet another, another reason to appreciate your participation today, Dr. Michelson. Thank you so much for your time. You. It's been my pleasure. And I'm, I know everyone has really enjoyed hearing from you. Thank you again.